Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Midday Live with me, AC Benewa Otu. Let's look at our top stories coming up in the next one hour. Chair of National Peace Council says vigilantism bill before parliament will not affect ongoing talks between the NDC and the NPP. Meanwhile, former Chief of Defence Staff Brigadier General Nunu Mensa says bill to deal with acts of vigilantism in politics is the way to go. And elsewhere in the world, Sudan coup leader Awal Ibn Alf steps down. Details of all these, including sports and entertainment, all coming up in the next one. Uh, let's do a very first story. And Chairman of the National Peace Council, Most Reverend Professor Emmanuel Kwekwasanti, says ongoing dialogue between the NDC and the NPP on disbanding political party vigilante groups will continue despite delaying all the vigilante and other offences bill before Parliament. Speaking on key points, he noted the two parties have so far shown commitment to disband the groups. Let me begin by saying that the mandate of the National Peace Council is to facilitate peace in the country and in respect of vigilantism. What we are seeking to do is to, in keeping with what the President said in his address to the nation, foster some kind of dialogue between the, um, the two major political parties. As you know, we have already um, had an encounter with them. It was a technical meeting. Um, the first encounter was intended to look at the terms of reference and the terms of engagement. Okay. Thank you to God after, you know, five hours of discussion, at least major areas were agreed on, which will be a basis for serious discussion in the coming, uh, in the coming weeks. And that is, the need to disband and the need to ensure that the political parties do not engage the activities of the Delanti in respect of, you know, elections and all that, and they need to cooperate with the police. Um, as far as I'm concerned, if you look at the substance of the community that was issued, all the two major political parties are committed to ensuring that at least violence and vigilantism is not you know, supported in this country because it is it is a, a minus in respect of our democracy. So they do agree that something of this nature should not happen. Now, if you look at it in terms of the um, the bill that the government has put before Parliament, um, some people are saying, is it necessary for us to continue with the with the dialogue? Mm -hmm. It is necessary for us to continue with the dialogue because we do know that you know there are so many bills in place, laws in the land that are intended to stop certain activities. But sometimes jaw drawing can be better than simply um, the enforcement of the law. Enforcement of the law is very crucial. It is very important. The law must work, and I support that. But I believe that we must also talk, and we must. Um, also, in the light of the law, take moves and try as much as possible to ensure that human weakness and other things do not, you know, um, give in for us to break even the laws of the land. So I don't really see how it is going to affect the dialogue that is between the two parties. It might channel, you know, the, the, the way the dialogue will go. In a related development, a former chief of defense staff, Brigadier General Nunu Mensa, has welcomed the laying of the vigilante and other related acts bill before parliament. Speaking on the key points, the retired general noted acts of vigilantism, if not checked, can destroy the country. Private legal practitioner Yao Opon also noted the bill is apt to keep violence in politics. We met here and discussed this very issue before. Mm -hmm. If you remember, my position has always been clear. And I said, you needed a law 
No political party to talk about the problem which affects all of us. A law, I call for a law long ago before the president, my good old friend, President Kufuado, thought about it. Because I came from background of law in the military. The law to deal with these matters. We've had political violence in Ghana since the 1956. And I was there. I was, there. I was at the privilege of being there. We didn't have NDC, MPP at the time. CPP, NLM, NPP, uh, Northern NPP. People's Party. Mm. Yeah, Northern People's Party. Mm -hmm. uh, and Anto and, and from the Volta and all kinds of mess. And so much violence before independence. So violence has been part of our political system. It has. And we haven't been able to deal with it until now. What happened last by election that we are talking about, which led to all this, was disgraceful, was, was, was sad. I have had the privilege of working with the NDC and the MPP. And I know there are very violent people within those parties. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking from experience. Yes. I've, I've seen violence with my own eyes. Uh, being coming from the military, I was horrified. That, as being as a military man, the violence that I saw horrified me. Unprovoked violence. I saw one 2012 election. I was in Winneba at the police station. Young men arrived with uh, crash helmets, beating people up. One man was smacked in the head with blood everywhere, put it in my car to hospital. I've seen this before. So this matter we're dealing with is not a joke. It's not just fun. It's a mm -hmm. serious matter. And I didn't think my good old friend Peter Kufado, I think he has thought of it, maybe has heard me talk a lot about this, that bring a law and let's enforce the law to deal with this violence. Don't ask the MPP just to go and talk about it. It's not their private matter. It's a matter that affects our security, mm -hmm. our very existence, because they can destroy Ghana. If what happened in the last by election is repeated countrywide, there be chaos, there be anarchy. So a law is needed to deal with this matter. The law wasn't being enforced because the IGP, poor IGP, is in a no-win situation. One of a situation which, which you should control. All kinds of groups are there. The Minister of, uh, the, uh, the, uh, Minister of Interior was there. The Secretary Advisor was there. The Secretary uh, Minister was there. So his bosses were there. The police ought to have been the only body there to deal with the matter. They needed any, any help, the military were there to assist them. Today, everybody is trying to cash in and, and give orders. I mean, that's why the IGP or the police are incapable of dealing with the problem. The bosses who ought to have been in the office, they allow him to work, are not allowed him to work. But my position has always been that a law is needed and enforced. Well, this matter, if you play with it, it can destroy Ghana. I had no doubt in my mind at the time the president said so, that there will be a legislation. No doubt at all. He, he put the mind, when you are analyzing a speech or a statement, as we all know, you have to do so, taking into whole. consideration the entirety and the, even the nature of the statement mm -hmm. and the person making it. It's now up to the political parties to express their view or to ensure that their views are captured in this act, which parliament has the power to amend as much as possible, this bill. So what will be contained in the bill shouldn't be different from even the memorandum of understanding that the political party would have come out with after their meeting. Let's still stay on the matter. MP for WA Central Abdul Rashid Hassan Pelpo says the laying of the vigilante and other related acts came, uh, came as a shock to him, saying the president should have allowed the two parties to conclude their dialogue. But MP for Equipim South will say Bonsu Amwa disagrees, arguing one party may decide to go against agreements, which hence the need to have the force of law as well. They both spoke on the key points. The, the bill has come as a big surprise to most of us. Mm. Um, the president gave a condition. He says that, or he said on the 21st of February, in his State of the Nation's address, that if the political parties, the specific political parties he mentioned, the big NDC and MPP, right. fail to address the issue of vigilant, vigilantism, then he was going to um, legislate on it. He got them to start talking, and then he's legislating. 
So the question is, what has prompted him to violate his own idea of getting an input into a law that he thinks would finally, um, uh, you know, at law vigilantism in the country? Okay. It's 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 confusing those of us who don't understand the processes that he's um, is putting in place. Our our view is that there must be something wrong in the whole idea of the president seeking to use political parties to start a dialogue about what it is, and then eventually, without listening to them and without their input into a law, the law is taking shape. So I think that um, the president is <coughs> too much in a hurry about it. Um, why the agency about it? Why the certificate of agency? You know, there are so many questions to be answered. The thinking is that all of us, all the political parties, think that vigilantism is 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 unacceptable, and that we should do something about it. So, for the first time, you have two main political parties that have always stood opposed to each other, agreeing on something. I've, I've, one would have thought that. It was a good start for the president to do something nobody has done. Mm. Get them to sit together, get them to talk about the one thing that uh, they, 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 they have the same idea, like minds on. And then he immediately violates that, that camaraderie, you know, that uh, cordiality that mm. he has fostered. You know. So I think that um, he still has a lot to do. Because the idea is not just to disband it, but also to get people to understand that it is not something we need to go on mm. to do all the yeah, well. time. Well, I think the president is moving in a very positive direction. Mm. Uh, we all recall that he said in Parliament 21st February that the parties should sit down and see how to address this canker, or you'd have to step in. Unfortunately, just after his statement, the body language, posture, the utterances of leading members of political parties gave the impression that um, they didn't see it as something very crucial. To the extent that it took them a long time to be able to even to agree to meet. And even in the course of the meeting, what came out was the impression that it was going to take them a long time to agree on what to do. And if for that reason the president thinks that he can preempt all this by bringing out a law that will spell out what we can do and what we cannot do, I think it's in the right direction. At the end of the day, even if you look at the bill, there are timelines within which political parties should also even act or respond to the law. Within one month do this, within three months do this. And it more or less gives us the perimeter within which we should operate. If I, I'm a member of a political party, I'm a strong member, a long-standing one. But I can tell you that if we leave it to our two major parties to be agreeing on whether to disband or not to disband, by the time we reach elections, we'll still be talking. And in any case, even if they issue a communique or pass a resolution, how binding is that? If somebody should renege on that, what, what would be the implications? That we agree that we will do this, we pass a resolution, but we've seen that one party is not doing the right thing. What do we do? So why did the president make that as an option then? Well, uh, for the parties to appreciate the fact that uh, this, this is becoming a major problem for us. And even though the constitution gives us the right to uh, form political parties, the constitution has also provided boundaries. In other news, leadership of the Teachers and Education Workers Union is asking government to immediately redraw the public university draft bill or face their wrath. The unions insist the draft bill clearly undermines the sovereignty of the public universities and also reject trade unionism in schools. National President of Teo Peter Lumo, together with his leadership, spoke exclusively to our correspondent Daniel Opoku here in Accra. According to Tewu, the bill undermines the sovereignty of public universities and provides the president's excessive power undermining academic freedom. 
president of Teo, Peter K. Lumo, called for its withdrawal to engender a peaceful industrial climate. This is a draft. It is called a draft bill. For us as a union, like I said, the preliminary readings is scaring us that what sort of bill, what sort of bill is this? Where government will, uh, will have majority five, government will appoint, how do you call it, a, a chancellor, which in today's situation, is, that is not it. He rejected reasons by the education ministry that the unions need not be engaged to make their inputs. In the Fourth Republic, this is one bill that I think is generating some some heat from from day one. So government should should be government should listen to uh, maybe those who have run the universities and so on and so forth. According to Teo, there is an uneasy calm at the various university campuses across the country. Chairman of the KNUST branch of Teo, Charles Arthur, demanded the withdrawal of the bill. We are not comfortable at all with it because this amounts to political interference and therefore we are saying that this bill need not to be even discussed for it to even come to the minds of Ghanaians. Acting General Secretary of Teo, Mark Cranche, said the ministry is yet to meet the union. We have had a cursory look at the, the content and we don't think that it is going to help us in any way. And that is why we think that um, we will not give it our support. Meanwhile, Vice Chancellor Ghana is here to respond to the draft. And former Deputy Director of Social Welfare, Chinibua Kodia, has entreated stakeholders tackling streetism to coordinate the operations as Ghana joins the rest of the world to mark the ninth International Day for the Street Child. He said dealing with the menace should go beyond just picking them from the streets and group them in their respective needs and preferences. The UN estimates that there are about 150 million street children in the world, with majority of them not attending school. In Ghana, it is estimated that over 50,000 of these children are living on the streets of Accra. Streets is the most research has bemoaned, hampers the physical and psychological development of children. In an effort to tackle the menace, NGOs including the Light Outreach Foundation, Cherish a Child Foundation and Future of Africa held a stakeholders forum to deliberate on the way forward. The forum also aimed at examining the existing strategies, highlighting the weaknesses and bringing out new ideas towards finding sustainable solutions to the plight of street children across the country. Former Deputy Director of Social Welfare, Trinibu Akodia, and treated stakeholders tackling stratism to coordinate the operations. We first have to identify areas, those who can help. We have to identify shelters. We have to train counselors. We have to identify home care nurses and those who will be with them. Because they, be, they should be assessment. When they have, after they have been picked, they should be assessment. They should be grouped. They should, not, they should be grouped according to ages. They should not lump all them together because ages, they all have aspirations. And then after we have them, them, we have to have to group them, those who want to go to school. How do we give them counsel? How do we prepare them to go to school? He commended government's effort, but added more could be done. Presidents of respective foundations working to end the menace called for a concerted approach. There are lots of organizations like um, us who are keen to address this problem. And I think they need to work with us. Um, so we have ideas, we have plans we want to, um, to put in place. But I also believe the government also has a plan. So why don't we all sit together and figure out what parts do we play? In the long term, we, we hope to clear all children off the streets because it's not the best. This year's commemoration is on the theme, Commit to Equality. And the Medical and Dental Council of Ghana has expressed worry over the mass failure of some foreign students during the council's Lancetia examination last month. Registrar of the council, Dr. Eli Atupi, says the council is devising ways to ensure the repeated trend is kept. A total of 157 out of 225 foreign trained Ghanaian doctors failed the Medical and Dental Council's examination which grants them the license to practice in Ghana, only 68 representing a 30.2% passed the examination conducted from February 22 
to March 2, 2019, and results released last week. Some candidates who failed have accused the council of foul play, alleging that the council intentionally failed them in order to make more money from the receipt. However, the allegation has been rubbished by the council chair. Registrar of the council, Dr. Eli Atupi outlined measures the council intends taking to address the situation which has been persistent over the years. The Medical and Dental Council, and we have taken certain steps to find out what exactly the problems are. We have identified that, yes, people really go out there for training. Unfortunately, some of the results that they take out there are not results that we want to really I want to talk about. But you see, we have all tried to be quite, you know, circumspect in uh, information we give out because it's a profession. He also assured Ghanaians that there is no cause for alarm as practitioners at the medical facilities are all qualified and certified to save lives. There is no cause of alarm. I mean, I want to really assure the public that individuals who had gone through our exams and had passed uh, have met our minimum standards and, uh, well, they can practice like any other person trained elsewhere. Candidates who failed have the opportunity to register afresh and reset the examination involving multiple choice and problem solving sessions. In a related development, out of 150 health practitioners placed for employment in January, only 50% of the number took up the job, with just 2% of the number taking up placement in the three northern regions. Director General of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Anthony Insiasar, explained the service has devised pool factors to keep what he termed as a menace. He was speaking at the 2019 induction ceremony for the newly qualified medical and dental practitioners. Currently, the doctor to patient ratio in Ghana is one doctor to over 10,000 patients. Quite problematic as it falls below the one doctor to 5,000 patients ratio per the recommendations of the Commonwealth and one doctor to 1,000 patients per the recommendations of the World Health Organization. Currently, there are 79 district hospitals with no doctors and 82 districts without a hospital in the country. At the induction ceremony of some newly qualified 106 medical and dental practitioners, the Director General of the Ghana Health Service touched on the need for equitable distribution of all health personnel. A region like Santa Reggio, which we were all shocked, 13 doctors who were supposed to go there, not a single one has reported, as we speak now. So there are two things that we are saying, that yet we want a financial currency so that names, so I can re-advertise, and people who are finished the house job who want to come and join, can join. Board Chair of the Dental and Medical Council, Dr. P.K. Nyami, said the council is taking measures to ensure standards are met in the practice, dispelling rumors of discrimination against some students who failed. The allegations are mischievous and ridiculous. The legislative instrument backing the Health Profession Regulatory Bodies Act 2013, Act 857, is developed with the assistance of the Attorney General's Office and the Parliamentary Select Committee on Health. It may be necessary to seek amendments to the original Act, Act 857, so that the operational value of the legislative instrument may be felt and also repair certain lapses. The Health Minister Kwikwa Jiman Menu, in a statement read on his behalf, cautioned the practitioners against professional negligence and NHIS fraud, which some of their colleagues are already exhibiting in the field. Some of the newly qualified practitioners say they will accept placement to other regions, but would like to do their housemanship in Accra. Well, I'll do one year in Accra, and then I will go to the north for the second year. I would prefer to be in Accra, then subsequently anywhere. A parent of one of the qualified practitioners wants government to have a real look at the fees of the medical schools. Parents go through a lot of suffering, paying their fees, their upkeep. It's very difficult, especially those who are put at fee pay. The practitioners were from the various medical schools across the country as well as some foreign students who passed the council's examination. 
In other news, residents of Mampehia in the Ga South Municipality struggling to access health care. Residents trek miles to access health care delivery at Ida Ubum, Abasaman or Bojasi. Most residents re currently rely on unconventional means of health care and self-medication with its attendant complications. Here's a report by Peter Kwao Adato. Mampehia is a settler farming community in the South municipality with over 2,500 population. However, the community has no health facility nor motorable roads. Residents say they have to trek between 60 and 80 miles to either Bojiasi, Kaswa or Obum for common first aid services. Emergency cases as well as women in labor are rushed on motorbikes resulting in complications and sometimes mortality. It was therefore not surprising that a health screening at the instance of Ashala Jazongo chief Alhaji Sariki Yusuf Tahiru attracted the attention of many. The hardship here is indicative of the general situation in the country. Government must spread development in order for those of us in the rural areas to benefit. Paramount chief of the English Ashifla, Ni Ashifla, Okuji Ama, appealed for the establishment of at least a chips compound to reduce their burden and save them from premature deaths. We appeal to the government to come to our aid with a hospital or at least a clinic to take care of the health needs of the people in this catchment area. Administrator of Kemet Hospital Limited, the benefactors of the medical outreach, Michael Tepo, urged residents to adopt healthy lifestyles in order to avoid diseases. And the number of schools under the school feeding program in Bolgatanga have increased from 33 to 76 schools in 2017-2018 academic year. Enrollment of pupils has also increased from 27,514 from 11,064 same period. Here's a report by Tanko Mohamed Rabiu. of the Ghana School Feeding Program through its school assessment and evaluation has enrolled 472 government schools with a pupil enrollment of 194,228. Azar Primary and Kindergarten with a population of about 200 pupil was one of the schools in the Bogotanga municipality without the Ghana School Feeding Program. The school was enrolled onto the program in September 2017 with a caterer and two cooks. Enrollment of the school has doubled as a result with pupils now regular at school. Officials of the school feeding program have meanwhile presented silver bowls and caps to the Azalonga Primary and Kindergarten School. Upper East Regional Coordinator of the school feeding program, Georgina Yamba, said the Secretariat plans to construct new kitchen with dining halls for schools in the region. We are having in touch with other NGOs and the government to their putting more plans to see whether we can get nice structures as kitchen for them, even dining hall. We are also listening with the community and the PTA right now, those who can afford and they are helping us. We are happy. Katra of the school, Victoria Ada, was not happy cooking has to be done in an abandoned classroom. Meanwhile, the construction of a new kindergarten facility at the school with a kitchen is almost complete. We have more coming up shortly. Do stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. An economist and associate